Well, heavy on the drums. What can you say? Heavy on the drums. That's actually Frosty's little nephew, Tyson. He's a, he's a keen drummer, but I just don't know whether the rhythm there is there. I don't think he's got it. What do you reckon, Mel? It sounds like that scene in the Step Brothers, in Step Brothers when <sighs> someone touches the wrong drum kit. Anyway, we'll keep on looking. We'll get there one day. Hello and welcome to the Cars Guide podcast where we tear down, pressure test and rebuild the issues of the automotive week. I'm James and with me is Cars Guide's fearless editor, Mel. And on the line from Parma in northern Italy is our very own valued contributor, Andrew Chesto Chesterton. Hello, world. <laughs> and he looks a bit like Dr. Evil on the wall there if you're watching on YouTube. Should I be stroking a cat? <laughs> this, this week, among other things, we'll look at jumping chimneys, high-priced ammunition, and a quality revolution. So stay with us. But first, Musk Watch. Right, so, okay. This week, crazy Elon's got even crazier. Um, he has tweeted that the company Tesla needed, uh, he said, to, to quote him actually, he said, needed another General Assembly line to reach 5,000 units a week for Model 3 production. A new building was impossible. That's Elon Musk saying something is not possible, which seems strange just in and of itself. Other cracks showing. So we built a giant tent in two weeks. Tesla team kick ass. Gah, love them so much. So Tesla's gone down to the nearest wedding hire place and uh, basically put a marquee up next to the plant and they're building Model 3s in there, which seems like a brilliant, brilliant plan. I'm visualising one of those outdoor pools in winter. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, it could be. Anyway, I mean, it is a fairly substantial structure to give it its due, but it is not the much promised and, you know, expected additional production line that was to be permanent. It is basically a, a marquee out the back where they're building a few more cars, but we'll get to that in a minute. Also, he sent an email to all Tesla staff last weekend uh, alleging that uh, there was a saboteur within the company's ranks, that that there was a a person at them from within. You know, it was obviously not one of the 9% of all staff that were let go in the week prior. So someone that that had hung around. Musk alleged this person tweaked code on internal products and sent company data out without authorization. Um, anyway, look, the full extent of his actions aren't known yet, but Tesla's suing him. So all of a sudden, everyone's against Elon. It's the haters, it's the media, and it's now his own people. Uh, Chesto, what do you make of that? I think it's incredible, to be honest. It, it has become one of the world's great soap operas, Elon Musk and his staff. First, he fires them, then he praises them, <laughs> then they steal his information, now he's suing them. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you almost can't turn away from a Twitter for all this stuff. It's fabulous. Absolutely. And look, where the rubber isn't hitting the road is the Bloomberg Model 3 production tracker. Uh, last week, we were at 2,612 for the week. And this week, we've plummeted to 1,566. So we're not exactly on the right trajectory for 6,000 at the end of next week. He'd promised that by yep. the end of the year, they'd be at 6,000 in a very bullish mood a few months ago. And that's looking extremely unlikely. Do we know how big the tent is? Oh, it's big. It it's could, pretty big. It could be really. You could have one of those enormous North Korean weddings in there, in fact, where you know, you've got a few thousand couples all getting married at the <laughs> same time. Like, it's a big marquee. <laughs> but building Teslas. Yeah, but they're building Teslas in there. They're building Teslas. Yeah. All right. Well, look, that, that's where we'll leave Musk Watch this week. It mm. it's, was a crazy week. And it just feels like we're reaching the end game, you know, that, that things are starting to really come crashing down i've Let's spent see. my whole life wishing i'd been able to watch the delorean saga rise yeah, and right rise and fall yeah. and we i may get the may chance. get a replay mm. that's an interesting one so chesto you, you, know, ha- you have moved precisely sixteen thousand four hundred and sixty seven kilometers from sydney to parma in italy and you've hit the european product launch trail with the new merc c-class fill us in on mm-hmm. your highlights so far mate is this one of those moments where I can finally make the I flew all the way to Palmer and boy are my arms tired jokes? Um, <laughs> I'm surprised you have so be- before that, I just want to make one very quick, controversial and possibly highly litigious uh, claim here. I've got a sneaking 
feeling that the Musk, uh, the, the number of cars Musk is producing has dropped so dramatically this week because I think he's banking some for next week to try and make oh. that title, to, to make so that title. So he's sandbagging on this week. I'm, I'm convinced. I'm convinced. Now, I'm, I'm convinced with absolutely no evidence to back that up whatsoever. So please, Mr. Musk lawyers, if you are watching this, this is just a personal opinion. That's a brilliant. It's definitely not an official claim. That's a brilliant thought. That's that's a reflection of just your psych, so which is fantastic. Optimist. And and uh, we'll check in on that face. next week. But so yeah. tell us. Palmer. How's it going? So, so far, so good. Now, I must admit, I moved all the way over here thinking that the international launch circuit would become so much closer uh, not really. I was on a launch last week in Slovenia that involved uh, a train between two cities, a flight between three cities, and a bus between another two cities, but we eventually did get there. Uh, but it just feels like I'm a part of the action here. I'm, I'm, I'm tapped into the European launch calendar, and I'm absolutely loving it. Good. Fantastic. And the, and the one that you more or less kicked things off with was the C-Class, mm -hmm. and um, we saw your video of the new uh, collision detection uh, kind of software that's that's coming soon, but w what that and what else impressed you? Okay, so that I think is actually really very cool. So the, the, the 25 word or less version is this. The Merc, of course, is already filled with all these sensors and all that kind of stuff for movement that comes standard with the car. So all Mercedes has really done is turned on a, a connection with the Mercedes Me app, which means if you're parked in a car park and someone bangs into the back of you, it'll send an alert to your phone. Likewise, if someone steals it, it'll send you an alert and a GPS location of where the car is and the same if someone tries to tow it. So the idea, I guess, is if someone does ding you and they don't leave a note, you can approach the car park and get the CCTV camera footage for that exact moment. Now, the next step, which is actually already possible, but they just don't have the legal permission to do it because of privacy regulations, is to activate the cameras on the car. So the moment you get dinged or yep. someone tries to break in or yep. steal something, gotcha. the, the 360 degree parking captures everything. It's killer. That makes so much sense. That would be extremely satisfying mm. uh, because mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but um, I've been in that situation where you've come back to a, a dented or, a, you know, as little as a broken number plate or some kind of scratch or scrape. It would be fantastic mm. to have that gotcha photograph somewhere in the in the car's ECU ready to, to use appropriately. Absolutely. Chesto, did it feel fantastic when we paid you to crash a Mercedes? <laughs> It did, actually. It did. Now, I must So, if you watch the video, and I encourage everyone to do so, it actually, I was genuinely a little bit nervous. It's a strange feeling yeah. being told to crash a car crash into car. another car. And, and it's only watching it back I realised how slowly it all actually happened. But, uh, geez, it's not a lot quicker from the passenger, from the driver's seat, let me tell you. All right. Well, Chesto, We should add he was driving a smart at the time. Smart car. Smart for two. And, uh, Chesto, you've been driving Merc C-Class. Mal, you've been frothing over a new Suzuki Jimny, which is sort of at, a, a, well, not at the other end, but close to the other end of the spectrum. What has got you so wound up about the prospect of this car coming back to the Australian market? Prospect indeed, because it's still not confirmed. Yeah. And I'm certainly not the only one frothing. This, this office was just glowing with excitement about this car the other day. Didn't see much excitement coming from the James Cleary corner. Yep. Uh, Chesto reported on it. Seemed pretty excited. Yeah, sure. Lovely array of colours. Go to it, Mel. Tell us all about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should add that I'm a former owner of a uh, SJ Sierra. Okay. Uh, but mine was the Holden Drover version, the QB Holden Drover with the square headlights. Wow. Anyway, outstanding wow. piece of engineering that was. Just wow. <laughs> and <laughs> something so close has been made new and may right. come to Australia. Yeah. Because it's, it's, it's retro without all the artifice of retroness, isn't it? Yeah. It's just simplicity. It's retaining actually making the car as it used to be. Yep, seems yeah. to retain all the functionality. Plus, it's got AEB. It's yeah, got wow. CarPlay. Yep. It seems to tick all the modern boxes. Yep. It's also got a solid front axle and a uh, solid oh. rear axle. <laughs> but that's a good thing. Uh, it remains to be seen what sort of uh, crash safety rating it might get. True. But it, uh, it's got the fundamentals, it seems, and a brand new body. Uh, unlike the existing Jimny, which has been around for 20 years. And the colour palette is kind of interesting. There are some 70s style it pastels is. and some b brighter ones. I struggle to get past the beige. The I'd beige, be very yeah, happy you with NATO beige. beige on okay. my Jimny. Anyway, we're hoping it comes here. James, Good. would you have one? Look, I'd like to have a driving one. I'm really keen to have a driving one, and I'd like Crafty to get a hold of one and put it through the full bore kind of adventure test just to see how it goes because just quietly i reckon it'd go really well damn straight um so it'd be interesting to see it but um speaking of uh all-wheel drive the oh no this is probably a front or all-wheel drive tiguan allspace 
Um, not yes, sh- no, not no. sure. Anyhow, yep. so Australian price and spec details for the much anticipated seven seat Tiguan Allspace has been revealed. It's a bigger body. Uh, there are four different engines, two grades. It remains to be seen, you know, uh, exactly how that will play out. But starting at 40,490. And all of a sudden, that's another one thrown into the pot with Santa Fe, Sorrento, the Mitsubishi Outlander. You've got your Honda CRV, Nissan X Trail. But Tiguan has such a great reputation and so kind of aspirational in the market. That will be very interesting to see how that car goes and, and what it's like. To me, mm-hmm. it's yet another mid-size SUV with seven seats, which is great. Yeah. Because if you find the Santa Fe, the Sorento, the Kluger, the CX-9 a bit daunting with their size, yeah. you can almost have the same sort of third row functionality as one of the bigger ones. And, and, and Chesto, tell me, in your part of the world, you know, mm-hmm. we're so used to being swamped by SUVs. What's the car park like? You know, what, what's, uh, what's the general breakdown in terms of conventional cars and hatches versus SUVs and all of that kind of stuff? Yeah, I guess it depends on where you travel over here, but anywhere even approaching a city, the smaller is better. So you, you are forever surrounded by smart cars, by the little Renault Twizzies, by, by every, the, the smaller, smallest thing you can possibly get, that's what you find near the cities. Obviously, you can't drive into the centres of town here. Parking is an absolute nightmare, so yep. space prioritises everything else. Yep. There, I, I have seen a grand total of one dual cab pickup in the six weeks <laughs> that I've been here. Wow. So, great, uh, what great. was it? One total. So actually, interestingly, I was speaking, I was at the uh, the launch of the X-Class 350D last week as well, and speaking yep. to the marketing director there about the challenges she has, not just launching a new car, but convincing, uh, you know, all of Europe to turn their back on vans and, and jump into a, in, into a dual car, uh, sorry, a dual cab ute. It's going to be something of a challenge for them, I think. Yep. And look, the, all the chat at last year's Frankfurt show was around electrification, electric, 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 <laughs> you know, you just couldn't get away from it. On the yep. on the ground, say in Italy, you know, um, charging stations, any of that becoming reality as far as you can see, or is it still kind of future focused stuff? Yeah. So c- keep in mind that I'm in Italy, which I think is uh, a little less electrified than the rest of Europe. There's still a, a real sort of passion here for, for uh, diesel engines, of course. But yep. um, in, in Germany, the charging network, charging infrastructure is becoming more and more prevalent. I think you can sort of end to end that country pretty easily, stopping in at charging stations along the way. But here in Italy, the home of Fiat, Chrysler, Ferrari, Lamborghini, etc., uh, the electrific- electrification hasn't quite taken off like it has in the rest of Europe. <laughs> All right, well, look, it's time to take a bit of a break and hear some wise words from an Aussie icon. Australian performance drivers love their cars and the performance car they love the most is the one that's done it all. From the Mount Panorama Winner's Circle to your driveway, all roads lead to Winton. The 2018 Winton Turbo now features an even more potent version of the powerhouse Redback two-stroke V9 Turbo, backed up by the latest generation version of our patented torque tumbler transmission technology. Once you eye it and try it, we guarantee you'll buy it. Australia's Winton Turbo, inspiration is standard. Torque tumbler transmission available at extra cost. Wheels and tyres sold separately. Batteries not included. Consult your Winton dealer for final pricing. Ah, Winton. Winton Motor Company. It's good to know that there's still, despite all the fuffle about, you know, Ford and Holden Toyota pulling out, that Winton's still there in rural Victoria pumping out a quality pro- uh, product. And as always, that begs the question, where's Frosty? Frosty Chops, Head of Corporate and Government Relations at Winton Motor Company. Last week, we, uh, we mentioned that, of course, he was at Le Mans because he has a special relationship with Fernando Alonso and, and uh, that all went very well. You know, Fernando picked up the victory and Frosty went from there straight to Kazan in Russia where the Socceroos are, you know, that's where they've made their cup uh, headquarters. He's a key background negotiator. He's working closely with coach Bert van Marwijk. And um, you might think Hyundai and Kia have got vehicle sponsorship for the event locked up. But uh, Frosty's managed to sneak a few Wintons into the FIFA garage. And, Good. in fact, look out for FIFA president Gianni Infantino being chauffeured to tonight's Australia-Denmark game in a 2018 Winton Turbo. And all I can say is, go Australia. Yeah? Go Australia. Go Australia. Go Australia, go Australia for tonight and look out for the Winton. 
But other things to look out for, Audi has released pics and specs of its new second gen A1 Sportback. To my mind, it still looks like an Imperial Stormtrooper. You know, it's, <laughs> it's kind of only angrier and it's bigger, but it's got some new engines and you'd have to argue it'll probably still start under 30k uh, before on roads for the, for the base car, which is a, a three cylinder, same engine as is currently in the thing. What do you think, Chesto? You know, there's all the talk about it's a glorified Polo and it's on, you know, a similar platform. It looks like a really handsome car. What, what, where do you sit with that in terms of the, the bra- uh, yeah, badge prestige and all of that? What's it worth? Yeah, look, I think that whole idea of it being a, a more expensive Polo or, or over here they, they describe it as a more expensive state, I guess I don't, I don't know if those things that have all that much relevance anymore. There is so much sharing across brands, across, That's a good point. Um, you know, is the X-Class really just a more expensive Navara, et cetera. So I just feel like all that talk of sharing platforms and it being a more expensive version of this or that, it really isn't all that relevant anymore. It's got the rings on the front. That makes it an Audi and that'll make people buy it. Okay, looking beyond the badge though, uh, yes, we may only be seeing the very top spec right now, but proportionally, I think it's far more mature and sort of palatable as a premium product than, yep. than ever before. Yeah, uh, the details are exquisite. Well, I, I think there are the best there are they've done in the last five years. Absolutely agree, and they've done things like picking out the external body color and some of the internal trim elements. Yep, um, and they've. Um, Brought some of the, the the little signature hints from the uh, Quattro, you know, from from the early 80s into this car. Really embraced the heritage. The dash is so dramatically angled towards the driver. All of that actually does look like the older Quattros. That bit across the top of the grill, that sort of second inlet. Yeah, it's fantastic. You know, someone said it looks like a Hyundai Kona, but nah. it's, it's it's straight from the Quattro. It isn't definitely it? is. Yeah. And uh, a couple of new engines, uh, rather than the 1.4 and 1.8 petrol engines, there's a new 1.5, and I think it's a two liter. Um, so they're, you know, the usual story, more powerful, more efficient, all of that stuff. I think there's a lot to look forward to um, with that car. I think it looks great inside yeah, and out. I think it does too. The I agree. The dashboard is fresh and exciting. Now, in not so good news uh, for Audi, their uh, chief executive, That's putting it lightly. Rupert Stadler, was mm. arrested by German authorities this week in relation, quote, to the manipulation of emissions testing, end quote. According to a report by AP News, Stadler's arrest followed a search of his private residence directed by Munich prosecutors investigating the Audi boss on suspicion of fraud and indirect improprieties with documents. So we should stress he hasn't been charged. He's been arrested and detained. But uh, that doesn't bode well. Is, is this still, you know, the whole Dieselgate thing, is that still making noise in your part of the world, Chesto? Look, it absolutely is making a hell of a lot of noise, and, and this is a huge scalp to be claimed if he does, in fact, end up being charged. Now, I read this morning that he is prepared now to talk to investigators, and I think part of the reason for that is, and here's something I didn't know about German law, they can ar- arrest you and hold you for six months without charging you if they wow. want to. Wow, six so, months? That sounds like... Six months, allegedly. So I think... So just arresting him would be motivation for him to start having a chat, I think, knowing that he could uh, he could be in there for a long time otherwise. True. But look, it's still huge huge news over here and no one really knows how, how high it goes or, or when it'll all end. Wow. Well, I mean, everyone from Martin Wintercorn through to now, uh, this person, that it's very much at the top end of the group where these people either in the US or in Germany are facing arrest and prosecution and uh, some are already in jail. And it's not over yet. No, it's not over by any stretch. Um, But look, more joyful news um, for the big Korean brands in that listeners are probably aware of the JD Power initial quality survey that assesses Mm -hmm. cars in terms of their fit and finish, the way they've been built and how they present when a customer first accepts the vehicle when they purchased it. So for the first time in the 31 years that this uh, study has been run, it was announced on Wednesday, it's Hyundai, Kia and Genesis in, the, Genesis in the top three spots, which I think is well worth a tip of the hat. You know, we've been talking for a long time in terms of how those brands have been just accelerating their progress in terms of design and engineering. Quality now is, is very much part of that, as, yep. as evidenced by an independent survey like JD Power. We should clarify that JD Power is a US survey, yep. so they're serving US models and US specs and, uh, you know, possibly made in all sorts of different factories to what we experience yep. here. Yep. But mm. what we what we see with our hands and yeah. 
touch with our eyes yeah. is uh, in accordance with what they found. And Chesto, it's all Fiat's and Alphas and Lancias, and there are no Hyundai's and Kias, uh, much less a Genesis, in uh, your part of town. Uh, look, there's a sprinkling of uh, sprinkling of Korean cars, but yes, mostly it is uh, FCA product on the road over here, which I don't. I, I'm not sure where that landed on the JD Power list in the states. <laughs> <laughs> I've read that far. But, uh, Enough said. <laughs> but it does. It feels. It just feels inevitable, doesn't it? That that yeah. uh, the Korean group of brands were going to climb to the top of that list eventually. Nothing frustrates me more now than when people still sort of turn their nose up a little bit of Korean cars. Those days are so far behind us. It's not even funny. Chester, I I would wager in my Italian experience that you see more Korean cars than Mazdas over there. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. It, it's a reminder of how big, big and important a market Australia is for Mazda because they are they are not strong on the ground over here like they are at home. I can tell you. Mm. And and to permeate uh, a market like Italy, yeah. with Korean products, you've got to be doing something. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's a massive mm. achievement. All right, that's well, right. Now it's time to take a word from the young guns at Oversteer. What happens when you put three hooligans together in one room? You get a podcast full of hectic banter. Hummer <laughs> is for any rugged man. This manly scent possesses oh, well, a bland. Uh, that rules me right out. <laughs> Jeez. Stupid stories. It's it's a cruise ship with all the inside scooped out, <laughs> water fills it up, and then you put a pirate ship in the middle. It's nothing more gangster than a ship in a ship. You're an idiot. And some discussion about cars. So we've got the K cars as well. What do you guys think? There's this new Honda sports concept there. I think it looks so cool. It, it does look a bit funky, mate. The Oversteer Podcast on the Cars Guide website, iTunes, and where all good podcasts are sold. Right, now on to the big blue oval, which of course does have a big European presence, but we're talking about them in the US of A. And a product that's been huge for Ford in Australia, of course, is the Mustang. And it's been one of their biggest sellers they're surviving basically on mustang and ranger at the moment Uh, and now 700 of the limited edition mustang bullets named after the famous film from the 1960s and the green i want to say 390 fastback uh, 67 67 there you go thank you without a badge in the grill yeah without a badge in the grill um (laughs) (laughs) uh, has been resurrected not for the first time there have been limited edition mustangs before but there's a lot of buzz around this and we now know it's going to cost seventy three thousand six hundred and eighty eight dollars plus on road costs which is almost eleven thousand dollars dearer than the manual gt fastback that it's based on so Mm -hmm. if you want to look at it on paper you get six more kilowatts and lots of stuff like a cue ball instead of a you know gear knob and you get bullet badges and you get the green paint and you get some torque thrust wheels and all that stuff so i'm posing the question to both of you guys is this mm-hmm. an instant classic and a keeper or just you get sucked in and it's madness and it's not going to be worth anything now it's certainly worth the 11 grand you reckon yeah okay i don't think you can get the green on any other mustang uh, okay but it's it's 11 grand to buy into the, the Steve McQueen cool. Right. They've done it before and before it's it's looked like they've slapped a bunch of uh, retro bits on a, on a new Mustang, but this one you is... You reckon it's a more thorough job? Yeah, it oh. looks great. And in the flesh, I saw it in Geneva, would you believe? Yep. It looks exquisite. Yeah, I've seen it too uh, in, the, in the middle and it does. It looks great. Saw it in New York. Mm. And so what do you reckon, Chesto? Is that a bit of you? You'd be steering a Mustang bullet around the place in Palmer? I've got to be honest with you, I'd be steering one in a heartbeat. I think, you know, that's the, that's the kind of car that's sold exclusively on image, right? That's, yeah. that, that's the yeah, whole, yeah. that's the Mustang thing. And it makes almost no practical sense otherwise. So in that sense, I think this thing's fantastic. And I think it'll do just fine. Yeah. Whether it's a, uh, whether it's an instant classic or not remains to be seen. But yeah. in terms, I don't think they'll have any problems selling the numbers. If they haven't already. True, true. 700, it's a pretty big number, but um, yeah, there'll be a lot of people champing at the bit to get into that one. Yep. And Chester, have you done the sums in terms of what fuel costs in Australian dollars? You know, a, a litre of petrol in Italy. What Do you know roughly what the relativity is? I do. I can tell you that driving over here is a staggeringly expensive yeah. pastime. So the, the fuel is about, it's about a dollar sixty-five, a euro sixty-five, I should say, a litre, which is euro a, you know, wow. Is that about three bucks? Stuff? No, about two ten, two twenty oh, a liter. Oh, okay. Um, Australian, and then the uh, but the biggest kick over here is the toll roads. The toll roads are ferociously oh, expensive. On the motorways. If, if you, 
yeah. on the motorways, yeah. So you can be stung, you know, upwards of 45 euro when you get to a toll booth at the other end of a long drive, which is about uh, 60 or 70 dollars, which in Australia, you know, we'd be riding in the streets. But over here, it's just the uh, it's just a done thing. So, so, yeah, so there's, there's still a booth. You've got to have cash with you or is there a little beeper on the screen? How does all that work? Uh, look, mostly. So that kind of technology is, is certainly being introduced over here. So if you pull up to a 10, like a 10 booth toll exit, yep. maybe two of them will be automated. And the other eight will still be cash and cards, so, wow. which is still the most popular way to do it. But it, as I said, it is expensive over here, so do expect a uh, – Mel, I haven't put in expenses yet, but they'll be coming. <laughs> <laughs> Don't <laughs> rush. <laughs> <Prepare yourself. laughs> but you, you wind up with a giant queue at these toll plazas, don't you? You, know, you hammer it's along ridiculous. at 130 or you know whatever the autostrada will um, look beyond. And uh, yep. you, you ruin your average speed by stopping at a giant queue at the damn thing to swipe your credit card. It's true. It, it makes it makes almost no sense, but you'll be shocked to hear that the uh, Italian infrastructure isn't the most efficient in Europe. So <laughs> who would have thought? But there you go. <laughs> yeah, well, look, many hands make light work, but um, it doesn't seem to work that way in Italy. Lots of people are always buzzing around everything, but not much happens. Um, Correct. Look, on other Ford news, I wanted to really just uh, give a small round of applause to Ford because they have indeed purchased the Michigan uh, Central Railway Station in Detroit, which is such a landmark building and had fallen into sorry disrepair over many decades. They've bought it. They intend to renovate it, all 18 stories of it, by 2022 to anchor a new, and the the suburb of Detroit is Corktown, so to anchor a new uh, future-facing mobility autonomy and electrification centre. So for mine, that just sounds fantastic. Mm -hmm. And it's a really great signal for Ford to be sending to the city of Detroit. And for anyone who's not familiar with it, it's it's kind of in the grand tradition of yeah. grand central station. You yeah, know, like we said, New York the, and, the architects. And all sorts of cities around America. Absolutely. Same um, architects that designed Grand Central Station in New York. So yeah. it's, a, it's a monolithic, fantastic building. So Detroit may still be in a sad state in many ways, but, you know, Ford... Who, yep, you know, as Detroit as anything is investing to stay there and Good on preserve them. its heritage. Good it's on them. Lovely to see. Yeah, the only one that I I, th- I would argue, uh, if memory serves, that didn't get a bailout after the G- GFC, they've um, they've kept their head above water financially, and now they're reinvesting they're in Detroit, which too. I think is terrific. Um, all right, now we're getting towards the end, but question is, what's been in our garage? Mel, tell us about the Isuzu D Max that you've been driving. Well, it's not in my garage. It's out the front of my garage because my garage is full of all sorts of toys. But okay. yep. Sorry to be literal, but no uh, worries. No, I had I had the D Max LSU Space Cab yep. over the weekend. Yeah, and it turned out to be the classic. Oh, you've got a Ute weekend. Ah, everyone's and leaning on you for yep things. The tray was rarely empty. Empty. The tow ball was rarely. Oh well, that's great though. Free. Yeah. Sounds and, like uh, fun. It did a good job. Did plenty of K's. Towed a car, towed a barbecue. All right. Picked up a, a kitty play cube last night. Did you fit in the child seats and things for your little kids? Does no, it have all that a, going it's on? It's a or? space cab. And all right. I, I didn't actually check to see if the mounts are there, but it's pretty tight for space. Right. For, you know, for example, you might fit a forward facing child seat in there, but okay. not rearward facing. Right. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, what it gives up in reseat space, it adds in tray. So space cab's not the full dual cab. It's just a, a yeah. like a, it's a two plus yeah. two for Utes. Yeah, yeah, with the two suicide doors in the back. Um, yeah. Handy for chucking stuff and keeping it dry, but uh, with a good length tray. And Chesto, what if, what have you, what's been your major mode of transport? Let's put it that way. <laughs> oh. Chesto's pressing. Hello, move. Chesto. I'm not hearing him. Do we have Chesto? Hold on. Can you yeah, hear me now? Yeah, we're Yay. back. Hooray. Ah, we're back. Hooray. That was great miming there, uh, Chesto. Well done. We just put the hamster back on the wheel. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. <laughs> the wheel of so, Italian uh, internet. So to answer your question, James, for me, it has been the delights of the European rail network. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As, as I mentioned before, the cities over here are very tight. The one I'm in is largely pedestrian, which makes great sense for a motoring rider. Um, so for me, <laughs> getting around has, has mostly been train and bus, which has mostly been incredibly painful. Yeah, right. <laughs> Good for the writing, I'm sure. <laughs> Yes, very good for the writing. Yeah, that's that, that is true. You'll and good see for the, the wallet, benefits actually, of that on cars.com.au. But what's been yeah. the, what's been the pain point, mate? Is it just you know the the navigating around or the actual service itself? Is it irregular? What what's the what's the problem, mate? 
It's because the trains over here, certainly in Italy, are an absolute lucky dip to the point where you can find yourself on the cleanest, most modern, fast, comfortable air conditioning air conditioned train that wouldn't look out of place in Tokyo. And then on the very next day, you can jump on a train that looks like it was built in about 1847 <laughs> and has has should have horses at the front dragging it along the track. So that's it's, amazing. Uh, it's, I was going to ask if it has cows on board. But that's yeah, amazing. At the front. Yeah. <laughs> Touch it and miss. <laughs> well, well, I've got to say, my wife caught a f- jumbo flight, a domestic one, in India once, and a woman on the other side of the aisle was cooking a curry. So oh, she had oh, a small a small Bunsen burner and was just cooking a curry. Forget, you know, no smoking. This was yep. a small kitchenette happening in, you know, 27F. <laughs> anyway, well, one way around the plane, too. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh, and she also had a live chicken in a wooden box on the seat oh, uh, next to her. Which Did it join the curry at some point? It was worried. It? Yeah, it was worried. <laughs> um, now, I, now, I've been driving the Audi SQ7, which is a couple of hand, hundred grand's worth of, you know, V8 grunt. Um, yep. And seven seat. SUV. Seven seat. And I did double check today because last time we had the car, um, we reported that it has ISOFIX locations on all five of the rearmost seats, and it indeed does. Mm. So if you had five kids, all in child seats, uh, you could fix them in ISOFIX style. But um, it's a big bruiser, a diesel V8, twin turbo, uh, lots of fun. Zero to 100 in five point Just under five. Uh, yeah, f- I want to say around five. Five-ish. Yeah. So for, for that, a couple of tonnes, uh, getting going that quickly. That's pretty darn impressive. It's not my cup of tea, but uh, there you go. Anyway, with that, I think we have reached the finish line. I want to say thank you, Mal. Thank you, James. And a river dirt chi, Chesto. Ciao to you both. Thank you very much. <laughs> and thanks to our producer, Marsden, for his work on the sliders and buttons. Look, he's not the thickest person on the planet, but he better hope that guy doesn't die. Uh, thank you <laughs> for listening. I could see he's chuckling. And please give us your thoughts on anything we've discussed today. Search for Cars Guide on Facebook, uh, on Facebook and Instagram and use the hashtag CG Podcast or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. You can listen to and now watch us on YouTube. And if you're an iTunes devotee, please rate and review us. I hope you can join us next week. Until then, last night I dreamt I was a muffler. <laughs> I woke up exhausted. Thanks, Dad. (laughs) Hit subscribe. All right. (laughs) You wait till Father's Day.